Come and join me. We'll teach the world to fly. Will you come and join me? I'll fly you to the sky. everybody to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast with me, your host, Bob Pizzini. If you've listened to my podcast before, you know that I love to interview and have discussions with people who not only bring great value to me and my organization, but these are people who I know are going to bring great value to you and your organization. Today's guest is a special guest in so many ways uh, that, that will unfold during the discussion. Today's guest is Kevin Adams. Kevin is truly a brother from another mother in that he served in the Navy for 26 years, as I did. He was about five years ahead of me. Um, he came in five years earlier and retired five years earlier, but we both served for 26 years. We both started out as the most junior enlisted rank and rose through the ranks to become commissioned officers. And uh, Kevin has since turned his skill, his craft into a contracting career as an independent contractor. We'll discuss that and learn more about that. Kevin, I'm going to read your bio here in just a second, but let me say real quick, welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. Well, thank you, Bob. I can't tell you what such an honor it is to to, to be here with you this uh, this morning. You know, I had an opportunity to read your book, and one, one Sunday, I just laid in the bed and I read your book, and it was just like going down memory lane. I mean, you know, it's, it is so wonderful when you see people and you have people coming in your life and you have such, I mean, so many things that just kind of parallel and even some dates that just kind of lined up with things. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just absolutely honored that I have had have the opportunity to spend this time with you and, and share what, uh, what the good Lord has done in my life. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, Kevin. Uh, ultimately, we're going to get to Kevin's political campaign. He is running for the 22nd State Senate District in the state of Virginia, but that's a that's a ways down the road. We're going to start out with your bio because you have a, an incredible background. So Lieutenant Commander Kevin Adams was born in June 1961 in Salisbury, Maryland, and there's a, there's a right way to say that. I hope I got it right. And uh, he graduated from Parkside High School in 1979 and enlisted in the Navy as a quartermaster. A quartermaster is a navigator. His first assignment was aboard the USS Mount Whitney in the navigation department. During his tour, he was sent to quartermaster class A school where he graduated with honors. In May of 1985, Lieutenant Commander Adams was transferred and assigned to Naval Station Annapolis where he served as the operations leading petty officer and craft master of two yard patrol craft. Noted was his crew's involvement in author Tom Clancy's novel, Patriot Games. We have to talk about that, one of my favorite books. And uh, after that tour, he was assigned to the USS Harry E. Yarnell, where he was selected as Sailor of the Quarter Sailor of the Year, and it's where he was promoted to chief And in the Navy. The promotion to chief is kind of a career milestone. It's a big advancement. In November 1989, Lieutenant Commander Adams was commissioned and attended LDO CWO Indoctrination School in Pensacola, Florida. Um, I commissioned in 96, 98, 99. I commissioned in 99 and, uh, and went to that same school. So again, you were exactly 10 years ahead of me there. Uh, he deployed twice to the Mediterranean as part of amphibious ready group, uh, amphibious readiness groups during Desert Shield and Desert Storm and Sharp Edge in Liberia. In January of 1986, Lieutenant Commander Adams was assigned ashore to the Naval Aviation Schools Command to instruct naval science. He took over as academics division officer for Officer Candidate School. Kevin Adams is married to the former Sheila Jones of Fresno, California. 
They have nine children. Yes, nine children. Alexander, Dylan, Jordan, Tiffany, Annalisa, Gabriel, Joseph, Joshua, and Sophia. The Adams family. <laughs> uh, the Adams family. Uh, let me do that again. That's with one D. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that's why. That's why I got a chuckle there. there I just read nine names. So, the Adams family resides in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where they homeschool their children. Sophia, their youngest, will graduate this year. Uh, upon Lieutenant Commander Adams' retirement, he worked in construction as a site supervisor for a year and then started a family business, Adams Family Handyman Services, LLC. The business has been serving residents and businesses throughout Hampton Roads and the peninsula for the last 15 years. Kevin, what an incredible journey you've had thus far in life and um, what, a, what a path ahead you are looking at. Tell us how your journey started. You grew up in Salisbury, Maryland. What was that like? Well, growing up in Salisbury, very, you know, very small town. And uh, throughout my whole childhood, I lived within two miles of all three of the houses that I, you know, that I, you know, that I lived in. And, uh, and it seemed like that that was just, you know, just, that was just my world, you know, uh, single mother. Uh, raising my brother, um, another long story. My sisters were taken from my mother early on, and so um, that was a burden that I, you know, dealt with throughout my childhood because I could always tell that that was something that was on her mind. But um, my brother was three years older than I than I, so we were always in different schools. So you know, mainly I, you know, I grew up with good friends. You know, I, I you know, I met good friends, and um, and uh, that's how I. Uh, you know, kind of got through, got through things. We were a tight family, my mother and my brother and I, and, and I had my aunt, who was my, actually my father's, uh, my father's uh, sister. And she, she basically helped my mother take care of me from, from afar. She lived in, lived in New York. But, uh, did you, did you uh, have any high school jobs? Oh yeah. I, um, I, I uh, enrolled in the uh, distributive education program. That was one. And I sort of kind of followed my brother um, cause he, he, he did very well in that and, uh, where he worked in like finance and credit. Um, I was more retail and I did that in several jobs. I worked at, uh, I worked at uh, Kmart, you know, I was, nice. I was like the, uh, 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 the, uh, the storeroom guy, that, you know, offloaded trucks and stuff. And then they moved me up to the cashier and, uh, and then I worked at Towers Jewelers where I was a stock clerk there and then eventually worked, uh, worked to the, uh, worked up to the, uh, you know, cash register. But my very first job when I was in the 10th grade was, uh, at Brooks fashion. And, uh, you know, that's where I got one of the, uh, that's where I got one of the best lessons, Bob, that I got. Um, there was a manager, Miss Ridgely. She was just, you know, just an absolutely just a wonderful lady and an older lady. Um, I mean, just, just very, very, you know, well kept. And, uh, and, um, one day I remember that um, I had to clean these windows. You know, and I just over and over, and she was she was training me. Yeah, she was you know she was training me, and uh, you know I wasn't I wasn't getting it, and um, and I, I you know I sort of uh, s snapped at her, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm gonna tell you what happened. That calibrated that she fired me. Yeah, and um, and uh, all the assistant managers were upset and everything, but. You know what, Bob? That was the best lesson that I got because I'd never been fired since. Because you know, there's a time and a place for everything, and uh, you know, when people are investing in you, it is very important that you understand that not everybody that's hard on you is against you. For sure, you know, and that was and that's what the lesson that boded well through my career. So you know, I, you know, obviously she's not around, but that would be one person that I would definitely would want to. Uh, you know, thank for what she what she did to me because that was a, you know, I was wrong, and I think the first thing is when you do something wrong, you got to be able to admit that you're doing yeah. things that are wrong. You have to own it. You got to own it. You know, and and then throughout the rest of the navy, that was the, that was like set the foundation for being able to see those situations and understand where there's time where you just keep your mouth shut and you move on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I in my book, I talk, oh, thanks for mentioning my book during the opening, by the way. Yeah. Um, in my book, I talk about defining moments. Yeah. And, you know, we have those defining moments in our lives. And that sounds like uh, that 10th grade firing was a, 
a defining moment and kind of help shape and and make Kevin Adams who he is today. Yeah, that was you know that was a defining moment because just that, you know just in that time frame, um, just in that time frame, Bob. You know, one of the counselors said, you know, you're not doing very well in school. You know, and uh, they got this program during the summer. It's called Upward Bound. Up, upward Bound. Up, upward Bound. Okay. Yeah. And um, she said, "Will you be willing to do that in the summer?" And essentially, what it was is you, you know, you instead of, uh, you know, you went down to the college campus, you know, Monday through Friday, and it took you through the classes that you would go through for the, you know, coming up on the on the on the, the year that you're in that you're going into, and then you know you had a work program, and then you were mentored by college students, right? You know, folks that are actually doing things where they're like, well, that was a huge contrast from the project life that I, you know, that I was, you know, uh -huh. you know, instead of, you know, running around and, you know, acting stupid and getting in trouble, yeah. you know, I started working towards, you know, um, essentially, uh, you know, learning classes, you know, and getting ahead in school. Well, the byproduct of that was that I wound up going from a CD student to an AB student. That's incredible. You know, during that, you know, during that summer. And, yeah. And actually, I was student, student of the year upward bound. Wow. You know, and uh, again, I had a whole different perspective again, going back to, going back to, going back to school. And I mean, that carried all the way into uh, going into the service. In your military career, why did you decide to join the Navy? Well, you know, like I told you, I, I worked in retail, and and uh, you know, I was riding my bike to work one work one day, and uh, my mother had told me she says, you know, Kip, that's what she, that was her nickname. She says, Kip, Kip. She oh, talked, Kip. Yeah. Okay. She said when uh, you know when you graduate from high school, you can't stay here because you know, you know, the welfare system isn't going to let us, to, uh, you know, let you stay here. So you, you got to figure out what to do. Well, I was working, you know, two jobs, making dollar eighty five cents an hour, and I was uh -huh. sometimes I'd work forty, fifty, sixty hours. You know, there was no money to to live there. So once I was driving, uh, riding my bike to my, riding my bike to Towers, and uh, went by a recruiting station, and saw this this uh, young sailor holding his sextant in the hand. I said, "You know, I want to do that." Holding a sextant. So a sextant. So so a, a navigation device. That's right. S e x t e n t. I think. A n t. A n t. S e x t. So a navigation device used kind of in the days of old, if you will. Well, days of old, but you know what? When things they work, still work today, that's right. They still work <laughs> today, and uh, and I and you know later on in my career, as I got you know first class and chief, I mean I mastered that. I mean I could take somebody right off the street and teach teach them how to yeah you know how to shoot stars. But you know you know it was just a just a, you know when you think about something, you're riding by a bike, and then next before you know it, you, you master a skill. Those are the wonderful things that you know that I observed just. Through my time in the Navy, now, I didn't get there right away because you know I did a whole lot of mess cooking, laundry duty, and oh, yeah. those those types of things. But those things, I think, help mold us as leaders. And you, you need the same thing. They mold you as leaders. You do things that are redundant, and and you think they have no value, but then they become the core values that you take on and you instill in others. Yeah, totally agree. And I think the military is really good at that. You get those, we call them, you know, the, the I, I won't use the four letter word, but we call them the blank jobs. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, everybody gets those jobs early in their career. And, and then later in your career, when it's time to lend a hand and get it done, you don't even hesitate. You just get it done. You know, I was in Iraq and uh, I was on a army special forces team and, you know, I had mess duty. I That's was, right. a, I was a, I was a Navy officer, yeah. and I had mess duty, you know, cooking for uh, for about 30 Special Forces guys, and yeah. no problem, you know, Just cooking one night and doing the dishes the next night. Yeah. So, uh, so you do what you have to do. So, so, um, so in your career, you served for 26 years. That's a long career. You were enlisted, then you became a commissioned officer. Ultimately, you taught at, we call it knife and fork school. That's right. Uh, but you taught at the, um, at the officer commissioning school. Uh, and, and was that Pensacola, Florida? I was in Pensacola. That's okay. Before they moved it up to Newport. Okay. Yeah. And, um, to, you know, just tell us about some of your key memories throughout your career, you know, to include the Tom Clancy. As a matter of fact, let's start there. What was that duty like? And, and did you, um, you know, were you in, did I see you in Patriot Games? Were, were you the... Were you the guy who... Page, page 525. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
You didn't see me, but there's a lot of them there. Okay. I was the quartermaster. Okay. All right. Yeah. What was that like, uh, meeting Tom Clancy? Well, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, VIPs come to the Naval Academy for various different reasons and whatnot like that. So our boat, a YP-676, which is the first of the class of the 6'7 class, uh, YPs are larger, 108 foot, you know, 173 ton uh, vessels. Um, I graduated from my operations job down down to uh, running the and running the craft, and again, I was one of the, I was the youngest craft master mm -hmm. uh, there at the time, and um, so they selected me to, to go over and, along with Rebecca Pereira at the time. She was the first female chief bosun mate in the Navy. Oh wow! And she was she was training under me for you know for the takeover yard for patrol craft. So they sent so they sent us over to uh, Dewey Sea Wall to pick up. Uh, Tom Clancy and we just we just uh, you know we just went out up and down the Chesapeake Bay. Um, he was uh, he was uh, uh, escorted by a commander from the naval the naval academy. I can't remember what his name was, mm -hmm. but uh, you know as we were walking around, you know Tom really wanted to see. He's a real you know nuts and bolts want to get into what the the, the folks do. Sure, sure. As an author, you uh, you got to get down to the brass tacks. Right. Yeah. So we found that you know uh, Chief Bruffy and I kind of sit off the side. He talked to her a little bit at, you know, as time went on. And then, then like the commander sort of kept butting into everything that we said and sliding <laughs> in and, and, you know, it was Mr. Clancy this, Mr. Clancy that. And then at one point, Mr. Clancy sort of just kind of nipped him a little bit. Yeah. I said, my father is Mr. Clancy. I am Tom. And I think he got the point and he sort of backed off and, and he let, you know, let, uh, Chief Ruffy and I, you know, talk to Tom and, and I mean, just absolutely a wonderful guy where he just, he wanted to know the, you know, the depth of thing. I mean, he actually looked at the call sign. Is that the call sign of the, I mean, he was just, that's just that detail. Yeah. Is that the call sign? Yes. November Echo, uh, November Echo Alpha Foxtrot. Yeah. That's the uh, yeah. call sign for this, this, you know, this YP. And of course, when I got the book, he, I mean, those details were in the book, you know, and yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But you know, the thing about the Tom Clancy books, and I just want to kind of go backwards is, uh, you know, even graduating from high school, you know, reading was one of those things that was, uh, you know, it, it you know, I, I, sure. I, I struggled with it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't fun, but, you know, after meeting Tom Clancy and reading the hunt for October, red October, and I mean, it, it, it became one of those things that I enjoyed it after that. And I enjoyed all of the, the, uh, the books that, you know, thereafter, you know, and I, and I have a whole stack of them today, you know, that yeah. even my kids started yeah. buying the books for me up until the time he passed away. Yeah, that's great. You know, I was uh, I was stationed in Italy uh, 96 to 90, no, 93 to 96. Mm. And we would travel all over Eastern and Western Europe and the Middle East and usually buy, you know, C-130 or C-9 or whatever the transport aircraft was. And this is before internet and before cell phones and all that. So I read every Clancy book there was. Yeah. That was like, you know, that was my escape during those transports. and. Yeah. And, and I mean, even like the, what is it, Cardinal, the Cardinal, Cardinal, the Kremlin. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and you know, you just talking about Osama bin Laden, and then here we are. You know, we, yeah. You know, we're we're you know we're actually dealing with those. You know what? You know th those things in real life. I mean, we we were dealing with it. Yeah. Well, you know, and and uh, I forget. I think the sum of all fears. I forget yeah. where he described the cycle of a nuclear detonation. You know, and um, it, in my military career, I had classified knowledge of, you know, the operation of nuclear weapons, things that I couldn't describe then and I can't discuss now. But uh, he skirted it. But wow, to see what he wrote, yeah, that was that was like, whoa. Yeah. You know, I got wow, I'm not even sure if I should be reading this. That's right. So that was cool. All right. So you had um a pretty exciting career and um uh after your tour um after your tour at the academy is it, did you go straight to Pensacola from there? Well, after you know, after, no, after the after the uh, Naval Academy, um, I went down to uh, down to Norfolk. See, now I got married now. Right? Okay. And um, you know, so Sheila was a cryptological tech technician. So there was only oh. uh, yes, so there was only a couple of places in the world that she could go. Yeah. And most of the time, when they're um, you know, when they're uh, they go out the first time, they go overseas. Well. Guess what? My uh, detailer was my company commander. Okay, okay. So detailer was, is the guy who writes your orders and tells you you're going to this ship or that right. shore duty station. Or... That's right. Okay. So I called him and I told him what the deal was, and uh, so 
The closest he could get was Winter Harbor, Maine for her and Norfolk, Virginia for me. Wow. So he talked to her CTV too. Okay. So um, needless to say, I wound up going to, um, I wound up catching the ship in the shipyard um, down in Norfolk and um, and uh, that's where it was on Harry, USS Harry Yarnell CG-17. Okay. You should call it Warship 17. Okay. Okay. All right. That's great. So 26 years uh, you you retired in what year? 2005. Okay. Pearl Harbor Day. Oh, Pearl Harbor Day 2005. Okay. And where were you when you retired? Here? No. Yes, I was here. I was actually with Newport News, but um, here in Norfolk, I was stationed here in Norfolk uh, on Enterprise. But she was she was going through um, a major overhaul in, uh, in uh, a shipyard in Newport News. Okay. That's where I caught her. And, yeah. and how many kids did you have at the time of retirement? At the time of retirement, um, all nine. You had all nine. All okay. Nine, all nine had arrived. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Yes. That's cool. And, you know, uh, I retired 13 years ago, and we all we all go through that career milestone, right? And it's it's um, it can cause anxiety for a lot of people making that transition. You know, 26 years, really our entire adult lives, all we know is the military and the Navy and and uh, so it's a it's it's um, it's a big step for everybody to move on. In your case, what were your plans, or how did you get through that transition period? Well, I wasn't quite sure um, what I was going to do. Uh, one of my C, one of my COs um, offered me a job out the gate to work for AMSEC. Okay, and, AMSEC is uh, uh, it's it's a uh, it's an organization that you know recruits people to do jobs all over, I guess all over the world. Okay, okay, right. And um, an employment agency. Yes. Okay. And um, I, I had thought about, you know, really thought about doing that, but all my kids were, were young and, and my, my oldest was getting ready to, you know, to graduate. So what that would have meant that I would have went back to Kuwait, because one of the things I did is I ran to port in Kuwait during, okay. during, during the, uh, during uh, Operation, Dur Operation During Freedom. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would have went back. That was a port operation. I would have probably went back over there as a civilian in the same capacity. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I turned that. That was that was one of two jobs that I turned down. I actually turned down a job for the CNO's barge, believe it or not. Oh, wow. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So that was one of two jobs. That I turned so that's a that's the personal vessel uh, or the not personal, but it's the official vessel of the chief of naval operations. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. yeah. 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 So Sheila and I got married and I said, you know, this is not going to be real good, real well to to be, have those type of, you know, in, in, in a marriage because it's important. I mean, when, you know, you're you know, during holidays and everything like that. You want to be with your wife, but, yeah. but those are the types of duties that you're generally, you know, supporting the Navy. And I knew that, you know, going into it and uh, because I was in for over six years before Sheila was in. So I understood how that worked, particularly from Mount Whitney on flagships and all the things that we did yeah. that because yeah. of holidays and, and okay. so forth. So how did contracting come to be? Well, you know, I always work with my hands. I mean, every, you know, I did three things in, in the Navy. I, I you know, I, I repaired ships, I trained people, and I went to war. Okay. So fixing things, you know, that, that just came natural to me. So um, my, uh, you know, one of the guys I served with had a small construction company. I went and worked for him for a while as a supervisor. Okay. And, um, and as time went on, um, still wasn't making the numbers because I lost 45% of my pay. Talking about hazardous duty pay, um, C duty, C duty. Not to mention, I was a Florida resident, so no tax, no, no state tax, no, no state tax. So by the time it was over, it was like forty five percent of my income, and I'm at the prime of raising my, you know, my nine children. So I had to go to work, mm -hmm. so I did. So I worked for the, the construction company for, you know, for for just about a year, and I still wasn't making the numbers that I needed. So there's no problem. I mean, I'm not adapt. I started, I'd work during the day for eight, 10 hours, and then I'd work three or four hours in the evening. Okay. And, and Independently? Independently. Okay. You know, I, you know, the skills I would take, you know, take the other jobs. And, and then, you know, America's the greatest country on earth. You know, uh, one of the guys that I was working for during that time frame, you know, he, he pulled me aside and he said, uh, he said, you know, Kevin, you know, these skills are, that you're doing, there's a lot of people that really could benefit for that. You ought to think about starting your own business. It wasn't the, you know, was it what I had anticipated, but, you know, the thing dried up with this construction company, and not only did he encourage me, he hired me to work at 
worked at his at his place for like three years. Okay. Uh huh. And I did essentially what I did in the Navy. I'd, I'd go do a zone inspection, figure out what needed to be fixed, and I'd go fix it. Wow. And, and he stroked me a check at the end of the month. Yeah. You know, and like I said, you know, it was absolutely wonderful people that will help you when you're, you know, when you're, when you're trying to do the, you know, trying to do the right thing. And even to this day, I have, it, I have the keys to his house. You know, if I need to do, need to do something, I just swing over there and, uh -huh. and, uh, the doors open. So it was the yeah. greatest country on the, on the planet. So in your con, so you've been an independent contractor working on your own for how long? Um, I'm coming up on, let's see, six, 16, 17 years now. Wow, 16 or 17 years. And then your kids came of age. And uh, do any of your, and do, well, you have, do you have nine people in the workforce? No, it's like <laughs> it's like herding cats, you yeah. know? I mean, they're all going in, in um, different directions. My oldest started out with me for a while. And, you know, you know, my oldest is, is, is his father's son. I mean, he, uh -huh. is, he is really, you know, focused on doing the things that he wanted to do. And and he went off and, and, and started, uh, you know, later on, he did a lot of things, but he first went on to love cars. So he started a little small um, auto auto dealership. Uh, my second son went in the Marine. My third son, he he gets to be with dad, and he's done that for 15 years. You know, we're homeschooled, so he even used to take his homework with him. You know, we were driving around, going from job to job. He would do his lessons in between. Okay, wow. And uh, the significance of it is, is he can do anything. Yeah. I mean, he can walk in a house and do anything. He hasn't met a door or window he can't fix. That's incredible. You know, and and uh, and absolutely, at this point now, I'm the gopher. You know, I, <laughs> I go get the tools and clean up and put things away, you know. Yeah. And But the most part of that is, you know, with my 26 years of service, I had 22 years of sea duty. Wow. So literally, oh, 13 to 14 years of their childhood, I was gone. Yeah. Wow. So I really enjoy every minute that my children are around me, you know, and. Uh, That's incredible. You were gone for 13 or 14 years of the upbringing of, of most of your kids. And you and Sheila have a solid family foundation. And, uh, you know, I know you both personally. And I know that you're a man of faith and you've raised wonderful kids. And you guys bake fantastic bread. And uh, so that's incredible to be gone that long and to have uh, your kids be as successful as they are is really a testament to you as a father and Sheila as a mother. Well, you know, the day is Sheila's birthday, you know, is 22nd. Here's an example of, you know, the relationship that we have. We are good with each other doing the things that we, you know, we do. And we, so, you know, we support each other to, you know, 100 percent. But most importantly... We go to our knees together, you know, and and we, and we, you know, worse of the Lord. It has been just so wonderful in our in our lives, and uh, I can't overemphasize the things that have happened in my life. I know that I couldn't have did them by myself without the strength of her and our and our faith. Yeah, yeah, that's folks. We're going to take a quick commercial break. Uh, Kevin is a independent contractor and good capitalist, and I am a business owner and good capitalist as well, and we will be right back. All right, we are back. We're talking to Kevin Adams, retired U.S. Naval officer, uh, currently an independent contractor, home handyman services, and candidate for the 22nd State Senate District in the state of Virginia. And before we start talking about politics, Let's just talk a little bit about leadership. Um, having served for 26 years, and again, you and I have having gone through a very similar experience in our upbringing, our professional development, if you will. You know, I have my view of leadership. I have my definition of leadership, and I have all of these lessons that I've learned that I try, try to take forward. How would you, how do you approach leadership? Well, first of all, Leadership in itself, it matters, you know, and I approach leadership from a servant standpoint. You know, I want to know all the questions, how, when, where, and why somebody, you know, will impart their, their values and their strengths into me. See, that's, that's an investment that you put into people. And as I talked about earlier, when we, when we talked before, you know, I got fired one time in my life, and it's because I wasn't paying attention to somebody that wanted to pour it into me because, you know, 
leadership empowers people to do things beyond what they think that they can do. Yeah. You know, um, I had a CEO, I had a CEO on my second ship, Aubrey, uh, Aubrey Fitch, uh, Captain Bud Weeks, and he would always say, if you're not part of the solution, you're a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and see, those things kind of just resonate because so when you're looking at whatever's going on in, that you're involved in, you start asking yourself, are you part of this problem? And I walk on the ship and, you know, the lights are out, you know, nobody changed the light bulbs. Well, it's always been like that. Just coming out your mouth means that you you weren't engaged. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, if you see something is wrong, you do something about it. You know, you see somebody that needs help, you help them. You know, this is the kind of unity and cohesiveness that uh, you know started with. You know, the, you know that you know that uh, starting boot camp. You know, we we graduated as a group of of individuals. So that's how I that's how I look at leadership. And. Who are some of you mentioned one former commanding officer? Are there other leaders or other people who inspire you either in the past or even today? Oh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, Ronald Reagan, you know, um, we were we were down uh, same CO, same CO. We were we were down at um, down at Gitmo and uh, we got the orders to sail east. Okay, They're, Gitmo's Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, by the way, right? And uh, you know, we didn't know why we were going over there. We just got the orders to go over there. And we, we wouldn't, I wouldn't find out till later on, years later, you know, you know, what happened, you know, what the impact of us going there. We went there and then, and then two hydrofoils followed us. And we essentially went around that island and, and protect, prevented Cubans from reinforcing that island of, of Grenada. And the next thing we know, you know, the, the fur is flying there. I mean, there's helicopters and, and, ground forces and all of this stuff going on over there. And, you know, I'm, I'm 23, 24 years old. Like yeah. What was that? 85, the eight, invasion? Eight, eight, 83. 83, the invasion of Grenada. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 83. But see, Reagan was smart enough to know that when you're in leadership, you take action and you own it. You know, that's the deal. When you take action on something, you own it. If you make a mistake, you own it. And we've all had times in our careers where we've made a mistake. And you get pulled aside and you get, sometimes you get chastised. Sometimes you get chastised pretty hard. But the fact is you own it and then you jump on that horse and you ride it again. And, um, you know, those are values that I think that make, you know, make, you know, make great, make great leaders. Yeah. And Ronald Reagan, I think is a great example because he did own it. He inherited uh, a terrible economy. And for the first two or three years of his presidency, the economy didn't get any better. Uh, it took time for his policies to have the positive effect that they ultimately had. Well, let me share with you, Bob. You know, Sheila and I had just got married. We moved from Annapolis, moved from Annapolis, moved down to Portsmouth, and uh, we bought our first house. Um, I think we paid like forty-eight thousand. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's ten and a half percent interest. Wow. Yeah. Right. You know, right. Ten and a half percent interest. Again, we were, you know, we we're just a single, you know, single income family, and you know, th you know, things were, you know, you know, things were tight. But I will tell you, through the eight years, you know, we got some degree. I mean, we got double-digit pay raises. I mean, throughout that's right throughout I this whole that. whole period. And and as far as career is concerned, you know, I went from you know first class petty officer to chief to to you know to a commission, and we started you know taking care of the military and and so forth. And it was a great time. There was a lot of people. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, and uh, he was a rising tide, you know, for a lot of us military folks that, that really changed the trajectory of our lives and now generationally have changed. Yeah, for sure. And the U.S. economy in general at that time as yeah. well. So lead, so Ronald Reagan, inspiring leader. Any others that, that, you, uh, that, that have inspired you? Well, here's the present day. You know, I watched... You know, I, you know, I, I started watching politics simply for the fact that I, I know I needed to know where I could die, dip and dodge, you know, mm -hmm. you know, whether I was going to invest into one thing or another, you know, because when you're raising a family of my size, you can't make mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, purchasing something at the wrong place and time and whatnot like that. So when, uh, you know, when our when our governor, when our governor came along. You know, and this is the first time in history that a governor is younger than, you know, younger than me. Okay, you're talking Governor Yunkin. That's right. Okay, Governor Glenn Yunkin of Virginia. That's, that's, that's right. I um, I'm, I met his wife in October of 2021. 
And uh, she talked to me for about a solid 20, 30 minutes, easy. And it was almost like you were talking to somebody that, that generally wanted to be intimately involved in your life. Mm -hmm. And when I left that conversation, Bob, I said, you know what? The fruit can't fall too far from the tree, mm -hmm. you know? And um, I thought, you know, this guy is walking away from doing, doing, you know, marvelous things in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the corporate world. Yeah. Private equity. That's, that's right. To, to, uh, come back to his state, his, where he, you know, where he came from, you know, just like, you know, uh, and, uh, and started his, his career. And I thought, you know, this is somebody I can actually get, this is somebody I can hitch my wagon to, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, you know, and, uh, then it now is history. I mean, you know, I got a chance to finally meet him just the, the night before the election. That was the first time I had actually met him. I had seen her several times. Okay, the night before the the, the, the actual the actual um, uh, the governor, special uh, oh the gubernatorial election the gubernatorial election. okay yes I got a chance to meet him and uh, and uh, we just exactly what I expected I found so. Extremely inspired after. Okay. After after that. Okay. Still inspired. Okay. Inspired to run for the twenty second district yourself. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You know, I ran in the seventh. Uh huh. I ran in the seventh district. Uh, you know, during that during that special election, and uh, let me let me let me share something with you, kind of personal. Sure. He came all the way from Richmond. Governor Yunkin did. Yes, with with uh, with with his assistant, um, I met him at the main downtown Norfolk. It was just the three of us, and uh, he invited me. And you know the first thing he said, he says, "Kevin, can I pray for you?" Wow. And then he said, and then he said, then he, and I said, "No, can I pray?" He said, "No, you pray, <laughs> then I'll pray." And so then we so then we sat we sat down, and the next thing that came out of his mouth, which was. Which I it's hard to it's, it's hard to even comprehend. He says, Kevin, I just want you to be you. Mm -hmm. I just want you to be you. I didn't get any stick and rudder. I didn't get it. And and you know, you know, Bob, in our field, most of the time when we show up to a command, the expectation is already there. Sure. You know, they they know that we have a capability to do a job. The leadership has 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 looked forward and saw that. And I think he saw that in me. So that it just inspired me even more. Here's a guy that's telling me, I just want to be you. And you know what? I know how to be me. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's great. So uh, what was the defining moment or the deciding moment where you said, I'm going to run for what was then the seventh district? That's correct. What, uh, what, what made you decide to run? Well, we, you know, we've talked about faith a lot you know, through this time that we've had together. And uh, I was working with my son. Uh, we had done a job out in Newport News, and we were on our way back. And, and um, I, you know, at, right at the last minute, I said, you know, let's go. Let's go. We, can, we, we were doing much the same work. We were tearing up the floor. So we're going to do the same. We had, we had an opportunity to do that pretty close to our house. I mean, we went left. We went home. We went right. We went through the store. I said, let's go right. Okay. So we got there and, uh, and I, you know, I talked to the, uh, the folks there and they said, yeah, well, you can go ahead and do the floor. So we started doing the floor. And then I saw this. And, and while I was there, I saw this young man just kind of sitting off to the side in the, in on the corner. And, uh, he was just kind of minding his own bit, his own business. And, um, then he caught up, you know, and he came over and started talking to me a little bit. And he asked me, uh, he asked me, uh, was this my business? I said, yes. I told him a little bit about my military career and whatnot. And um, as I was walk as he was walking out the door, I have to kind of digress back a little bit. About three or four years prior to that, my son said, Dad, you ought to run for Congress. <laughs> you know, just out of the blue, we're all fishing. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, you ought to run for, run for, you know, run for a Congress. Well... As he was walking out the door, I said, you know, I thought about running for Congress. And so I was still tearing up the floor. This guy was out there. He drops his bag on, on the sidewalk out there. And next thing I know, he calls me up and he says, uh, uh, my father wants to talk to you. So, and then in that conversation, it came up, 
you know, he was uh, part of the Republican Party of uh, of Virginia, and he said, we think you ought to run for state center now. You know, my head's getting ready to blow off. <laughs> you know, I'm tearing up the floor here. Yeah. And now this guy that doesn't know me from literally Adam, he's saying, you ought to run for state senate. But, you know, in my life, I've had times where I knew that the Lord showed up. I mean, you know, showed up. And now his father is here. Oh, by the way, then his mother and his sister shows up. And we're all standing out here. George still, he's fixing the floor. I'm out here talking. To uh -huh. And next thing I know, he's telling me that, yes, you should, be, you, you should run for the Virginia State Senate. And my head is about to explode. But I felt that. I felt that now I've been sitting in front of the TV every afternoon when I get out of the screaming at things that are going on. I see how things in, in our economy, how it not only affects my life, but see as a contractor, I'm in people's houses from Section 8 to millionaires. Okay. I see all of it. Section 8, government-assisted housing. Gover government-assisted housing and whatnot. I, I see it all. And, and I'm thinking... First of all, I'm thinking, is this something I can do? Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at our look at our backgrounds, Bob, you know, we always went into jobs that we didn't think we could do, but we were thrusted in there and we did what we had. And we tackled it. And we tackled yeah, it. Yeah, we went in there, went in there and just gave it everything that we had to give. Yeah. Hoping hoping that uh that we were doing doing the right thing. But the but the outcome of it is is there was always great people alongside you. To help you along the way and that's what you know that's what this that's this how that's is how this journey has been so uh, i'll digress back it's 11 o'clock at night i go home and i and i stand sheila's out this is way past her bedtime mm -hmm. and uh i stay in the edge of my bed and uh i said lord if this is something you want me to do if this is something you really want me to do when i get up in the morning and i read my devotion she'll tell me I got up in the morning, I read Isaiah 40, 29. And I read that devotion where it talks about Moses, where he was sent to do what he know that thought he couldn't do. And Bob, I will tell you, every time I think about it, I get chills and I get welled up because the tears just started running out my face, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm saying, God, you're showing up for something. This is not something that you want me to walk away from. Mm-hmm. So Sheila comes out of the bathroom and I and she looks at me and says, You're awful emotional over <laughs> there, right? And I say to her, I said, Sheila, you know, I just got asked by the Republican Party of Virginia Beach to run for the Virginia State Senate. She didn't even blink, she said, if she said, as long as it doesn't change you. <laughs> and I knew from there, this is this is the that was the destiny. Now that was July the 28th of 2021. Okay. Now you have to understand the governor was elected. There was no primary. There was no primary for the congressional race. None of this was, none of this was there. So I even equate you and I sitting across the table talking about this for all my football players out there. If you took a dime and you put it at a goalpost, and you could find somebody that could take a dart and throw it 100 yards and hit that dime dead center, that's the chances of us sitting across from each other. Yeah, wow, wow. You see, I think, I digress back to my faith, I think that sometimes we don't realize how God really works in our lives, you know, and you know, we have that choice, you know, he gives us free will to, you know, to either take on what is presented to us and deal with the things, that, uh, you know, you know, we're not robots, we we're not, he doesn't treat us like robots. Mm -hmm. And I have found the more that I surrender, the more that I see happens in and around my life. And not only that, but the life of the people that are around me. So you made the decision to run in that special election very short notice, very short short time from launch to election day. Yes. Uh, for somebody who's brand new to politics, yes. what was that like? What was that period of time like? 
it was like wartime steaming. That's what, <laughs> that's what it was. I mean, it was, it was like, uh, you know, 20, you know, almost 20 hours a day when you talk about everything that was, you know, everything was involved. Mm -hmm. Um, I found myself in places where people were like, what are you doing here? I mean, like economic development, you know, um, meetings and civic leagues and, and just, you know, place because mm -hmm. I want all the things as a contractor and as a military guy that I was exposed to, there were so many things that are out on the periphery of some that you had to have like a, a, a broad sweep of all of that stuff when you're going to go represent the group of people that, that are in your, that are in your district. Mm -hmm. And of course you got to get them, you got to get to know them. And, and, uh, and again, I was absolutely a nobody. But not per se, because a lot of people knew me from the, the military. I mean, I know tons of folks from the military. Sure. And then lots of folks from, you know, from my business. But, you know, I mean, this, this, was, this was a total, you know, flip of careers or, or occupation, mm -hmm. you know. But, again, it was it's just like when I, when I first got commissioned as a quartermaster, they had me splashing 90 ton causeways off of LSTs. Yeah. I never did that before right. either. Right. Those so. are floating piers. So here's a young man. You were, you were probably maybe 30. I was 28 years old. 28 years old. And you are moving tons of heavy military equipment. Ship to shore. <laughs> Ship to shore. Yeah. Wow. So what is it that you hope to accomplish as a state senator? Well, first of all, the, 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 one of the things that I, I hope to accomplish is to, expo is to showcase servitude. You know, these offices were designed for people to go in them to serve the people. You know, understand who the people are and those people be connected to them. Mm -hmm. You know, not necessarily, you know, name bases, but to the point where they even feel like this is a person that I can reach out to mm -hmm. and I can, I can tell them, you know, my story or my situation and they'll listen, they, they'll listen to me. Someone that is looking at that is able to look at the huge picture, you know, look, not just what's in front of me right now, but you know, five, 10, 15 years down the road, just like, you know, raising a family, mm -hmm. you know, Bob, I couldn't raise nine children by, you know, day to day. I had to look, forward thinking. I mean, I had to look five, 10, 15 years down the road, just like I used to, um, you know, it's still in my, it's still in my, uh, my sailors. You got to have a one to five and a 10 year plan. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and, and see those are the, you know, I want to bring those, I can, I want to bring those values and whatnot to people so that they understand that someone really cares. You know, you can tell when somebody really cares because they pay attention to you. And I think that, you know, following politics for years, you know, kind of, you know, you know, banging on the table and wanting to throw something at the TV, mm -hmm. you know, you know, again, are you going to be part of the solution or are you going to be part of the problem? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I, and I feel like I can be part of the solution because I understand the issues that people have. And let's face it, Bob, I have no desire to be a career public, a career um, public servant. I, just like I did four years at one ship i go to next ship i do four years and whatnot like that you do a good job and then you you know you move on mm -hmm. and i've been serving for over 50 years you know what i like to do is serve well and then go fishing so uh so you know how to serve you've you've served your country for 26 years you've served your clients 17 for 17 years and uh so you know what service to others is all about and you know how to fish I do. I love <laughs> where do you like to go well look i like to go in i like to go in the little ponds and that's one of the great thing about you know being a contractor and even better doing what i'm doing now because you get a chance to find all these little places that are okay tucked away and you know it's just like just being like a little part of just being in my own world and and and, and thinking about you know the you know how much i've been blessed you know, and then, and then on top of that, the icing is, is you meet all these wonderful people that you would never had an opportunity to meet, um, and, uh, and inspire them to do, and to do well in their, well in their lives. You know, um, over the last 21 months, I've had people that have come back to, come back to me that 40, you know, 40 years, you know, that we've reconnected and, 
And uh, it's almost like, you know how we are, we pick up right where we left off. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, uh, that's an innate skill that is learned throughout our careers and it's, it's so valuable and, and, um, uh, so meaningful. Yeah. So to be able to do that. Okay. Um, what haven't I asked you up until this point? What do you think it's important for our listeners to know about Kevin Adams, the retired military officer, Kevin Adams, the father of nine and husband and Kevin Adams, the politician? Well, I can give you the first 15 seconds. First of all, I love the Lord. And I know not everybody is where I'm at. I, I get it. You know, I love this. I love this country. You know, this is the greatest country on the planet for somebody like myself to grow up in my, you know, my beginnings and to be able to not run for office once, but twice. It's phenomenal. I mean, that in itself, you know, just explains just how wonderful the country is but then the people you know just like yourself bob you know i met you a year ago and um you know it's almost like we've been knowing each other for years because when people really genuinely care about each other they impart themselves in their lives and see i want to showcase that because we have a lot of problems with broken families um you know drug abuse um, this fentanyl. Me fentanyl, mental illness, and all of these things. And I think that all of these things can be solved with good relationships with people. And, and that's where we have to come together as a country and as a state. And we have to find where we can get the 70%. You know what I mean? It, it, it's all, you, you get nothing done, you know, all or nothing. And, you know, politics is just like that. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm going to just whack your head off and unless you whack my head off first. I mean, it shouldn't be like that. We should be able to come to the table and take good ideas and figure out the way, you know, make them happy. You know, when I, when I had to learn how to splash those 90-ton causeways, there were young guys out there that had never done it before that did not understand the procedures like I did but they had ideas that worked, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And that's the whole part of the, the, the people issue. You know, people capital is fantastic because people have the ability to figure out how to do things well. And government should stand back and allow them to do that. You know, no one has to tell me how to create a living, like much like most everybody else. They just have to kind of get out of the way and let us do that. I mean, we got to have some guardrails. I get it. But we shouldn't have restrictions to the point where we can't, you know, we can't uh, solve the problems that businesses need, so that we can, so that we can serve the families and our constituencies. Yeah. Last question for you: How important is this upcoming election? Well, I think that this election is going to um, determine the trajectory of this country. Um, the country is tired of seeing this back and forth with, with you know, back and forth with politics. I think our governor, because I mentioned him as one of the ones that uh, really inspires me. He doesn't look at Democrat, Independent, and Republicans. He looks at Virginians, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, see, that's that's kind of the the area that we've been in all of our lives. We look at the military. You're a sailor. You don't matter who you are. You know, you, we have a job and You're we work teammate. together. We're a teammate. And see, that's how he sees governing here, governing here in Virginia. And I think the whole country's watching. I think that... What happens here in November is going to be uh, pivotal to what's going to happen in the country. And it's very important, I think, that, um, that we're able to um, gain this race so that we can see what it's like. Because, see, when that, I'm going to go back to Ronald Reagan because we talked about him before. Mm -hmm. When Ronald Reagan showed that his policies and his um, approach to leadership, how it worked, he changed the minds of the whole country. How else do you win 49 states? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because you win the hearts of people. And guess what? We elevated this country to a point where it's never been before. And I think we can do that. We can do that do that again with the, you know, with the with the right leadership and with the right attitude. And I think we we're at a stage in this country now. I think we have to change the attitude. You know, up is down and down is up. I mean, we we gotta, you know, we have to 
we, we have to come together as a people and uh, things have to pass the reasonability test, you know, and most people, you might want to deny it, but we can get to the point where, you know, this is reasonable, mm -hmm. you know, that's not reasonable. And that's where we, that's the, where we need to be as a people, because it, in between all of that is life. And if we're, if we're not coming to consensus on things, life becomes hard for everybody. So that's sort of, you know, that's sort of in a nutshell, what I, what I see going forward here is that, you know, we got the, you know, we have to get the right leadership in the right places so that we can change the trajectory of the state and I think also the country. Kevin Adams, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. Absolutely. My pleasure. Look forward to doing, doing it in the future. All right.